<clears throat> See? Okay. I want to uh, talk this evening about a man that I don't know if you've heard of him or not, but uh, you will want to hear more about him, I hope, after this evening. His name is Gideon Oosley. Gideon Oosley. And uh, he lived from the 24th of February in 1762, which is when he was born. And he died on the 13th of May, 1839. And he was known as the Irish evangelist, the Irish evangelist. And before I go further, I want to just read one verse that I think is going to have a bearing on our topic this evening. And it's a well-known verse. And we're reading it from the King James, and it's from Proverbs 29, verse 18. And I'm just going to read the first part of it. You know the verse well, I'm sure. But it simply says this, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there's no vision, the people perish perish. Sadly, <clears throat> Gideon Oosley is very, um, not very well known today. Um, the last biography of him in the, that was written in the 20th century was actually published by the Salvation Army. And they published it to say uh, to their own people, this is the kind of compassion we need to be effective in the work of the Lord. So they used his biography uh, as an example of that kind of compassion that's needed today. And uh, I came to uh, hear about him, first of all, through Uplook Magazine. A um, number of years ago, Uplook Magazine uh, had a, a kind of a column, uh, regular column done by a man called John Burley, who, by the way, is very sick right now in intensive care, I believe, with uh, COVID. And uh, I'm sure would value our prayers. But he uh, wrote um, numerous little biographical sketches of heroes of church history. And that was when I first heard of a man called Gideon Newsley. And then I came across him again, reading uh, this magnificent set, the six volume set by Mr. Cruikshank called The History of Irish Methodism, called Days of Revival. That's the subtitle, amazing work. And Gideon Newsley uh, figured quite prominently in that. And then um, I came across this book, I'm gonna show it to you. Uh, it's by Ian Murray. And uh, he's a very excellent biographer. And it was on Wesley and the men that followed him. And so he does a little biography of Wesley, but mainly it's the, what happened after Wesley. Who were the men that kind of moved the work forward after he passed away? And so Gideon Oosley uh, figures quite prominently in that book as well. So what do we uh, think about him? Well, first of all, <clears throat> this is what uh, people have said about him. He was one of the truest lovers of the Irish people who ever lived. Now, that's quite a compliment, isn't it? One of the truest lovers of the Irish people who ever lived. It was said of him, amongst all the eminent men raised up by God in Irish Methodism, I doubt if any other was ever so successful in winning souls to Christ as Mr. Oosley. In other writer states, he was one of the most successful and the illustrious evangelist who ever proclaimed Christ to perishing sinners. So obviously high recommendation from people uh, that knew about him or knew him. So what is the background? Well, I wanna kind of step back a little bit and I wanna talk about Mr. Wesley, John Wesley in Ireland, just to kind of set the scene. Although Methodist work in Ireland actually began in 1746, through the labors of a man called John Senek. And uh, I'm not sure if you would know John Senek, but uh, the hymns of worship and remembrance, uh, the hymn number 40, brethren let us join to bless Jesus Christ, our joy and peace. Well, John Senek wrote that hymn and many others, but that's the only one we have in our hymn book. But uh, he was the first man really to labor uh, for the Methodists in Ireland in 1746. Mr. Wesley, uh, came to visit Dublin in 1747. And the work in Ireland became one of his enduring concerns. Uh, it was a real burden on his heart. It was burdened about Ireland and the gospel for Ireland. And he made 21 visits, did Mr. Wesley, in his lifetime. And when you add up the length of those visits, he actually spent six years of his life preaching the gospel in Ireland. Now, when you just add up all the 21 visits and the length of time he spent there, 
And one of the things that he did say was this. He said, have patience and Ireland will repay you. Now, I want you to keep that in your mind. Have patience and Ireland will repay you. And we're going to see towards the end of this message just exactly how that uh, statement by Mr. Wesley became very true. Have patience, Ireland will repay you. <clears throat> the challenge for, of Ireland was reaching the native Irish. There's always been, and you probably have heard of many Irish preachers, but most of them were descendants of English and Scottish settlers. Uh, so even uh, dear Brother Mercer that joins us. Uh, again, he lived in Ireland, but he was a descendant of either English or Scottish settlers. I think perhaps Scottish, I'm not sure. Uh, but, uh, and, and those were traditionally Protestant and they were more open to the gospel. But reaching the native Irish was a huge issue. How do you reach these people? They spoke a different language. They actually, Gaelic was their first language, their heart language. And Mr. Wesley stated that at least 99 out of 100 of the native Irish remain in the religion of their forefathers. So only one in 100 would break out of the Catholicism that dominated the Irish landscape. And he criticized the state church, the Church of, of, of Ireland, or Church of the Anglican Church, as we would know it. And what he said is, when the Protestants can find no better way to convert the Catholics than through penal laws and acts of parliament, we have a serious problem. And of course, they did. They tried to use the state to punish the, the Catholics for carrying on their religion and also uh, acts of parliament forbidding them to hold mass and all these things. And it actually caused more resentment towards the gospel than love to, to the gospel. And also no, no uh, friendship of England. They were passing these laws. So the, the situation, uh, it, it, as far as Wesley was concerned, could only change when the people learned of a ministry more holy and more wise than their own. He said, that's what they need, a ministry more holy, more wise than their own. And the Methodists, although unordained and certainly very untraditional in their day, in the way that they went about their business, they were men who were anointed of the Holy Spirit and the truth of their message, they drove home with great power and great effect. And in a very real sense, they did more for the evangelization of the Irish than any other group up to this point in history. In fact, by the time of Wesley's death in 1791, so remember he visits in 1747, has a burden for Ireland. By 1791, there were 75 fearless Methodist evangelists who were going across the landscape preaching the gospel of Christ. Uh, salvation through the finished work of Christ and him alone. And by 1800, the Methodist Conference could report revival in the west of Ireland. If you know anything about Ireland, the more west you go, the more Catholic it is. Part of the reason for that is Oliver Cromwell, uh, when he uh, conquered Ireland, he, he drove the Catholics, as he said, to hell or to Connaught. So you either kill them or you drive them to the West, which was a very barren landscape. He said it was so barren. Uh, he said there was, there's not enough wood to hang a man, not enough water to drown a man, and not enough clay to bury a man. So he drove the, the Catholic population to the West of Ireland. And so the West was very difficult to reach because it was persecuted people and a a people who found comfort and consolation in their religion in all this opposition and persecution. But now there's 75 of these fearless evangelists and they're seeing revival even in the West of Ireland. And that's where our man Gideon Oosley comes into the story. So I want to give you a little bit of his family background and his connection. He was born in a place called Dunmore in County Galway. Now, my wife is from County Galway. In fact, a 50-minute drive away or 66 kilometers from Dunmore is where my wife was born, 40 miles away for those that speak English. Uh, and um, <clears throat> that's where she was born. Uh, his background 
had prepared him to become a bridge between the divided communities in that land. In name and in genes, and I'm not talking about Levi's or Wrangler's, but you know, the genetic things, uh, in genes, uh, he was English. His ancestors had come over from Northampton in England 100 years previously. However, where he lived in the west of Ireland and a lot of his pals and friends and the circumstances of his upbringing, uh, he was among Irish speaking country people all the time. And he was in many ways, in his ways and character as Irish as his Connaught brogue was. Uh, and he had a great sympathy for the oppressed and poor majority of the Irish people. His father was a deist. Uh, the deists believe that God exists, but he basically uh, kind of set the world in motion and then went in the back room uh, just to, to read or do whatever he did and just left everything to man to figure out and not really directly involved in the affairs of men. His father was a deist, but he wanted his son to train for the Church of Ireland because it was a comfortable living in those days. And he was concerned about his well-being. And he thought if he got a job, you know, if he ended up as a Church of Ireland man, he'd have a manse and he'd have a good income. And, and that was what he was concerned about. And so he got tutoring uh, by a Catholic priest paid by his father so that he could learn Latin and mathematics and prepare him uh, for entrance into Trinity College in Dublin, where he would train to be a clergyman. But a change in family circumstances affected things. His father was left a valuable farm in County Roscommon, and a good lifestyle was secured uh, for his son without the aid of a position in the church. And so that was abandoned. Gideon, at the age of 20, married Harriet Wills. And his father-in-law gave him the wedding gift of both a house and lands. Now, wouldn't that be nice if your father-in-law gave you a house and lands? That would be a great start, wouldn't it, to your married life? Well, that's how he started out. And what it did was it enabled him to live the life of a wealthy, fashionable socialite, drinking and gambling and hunting and living as a man of leisure. Later on, relatives uh, on his wife's side contested the will and he ended up losing the house and lands, but he didn't change his lifestyle. He had gotten into that lifestyle of being kind of the, the country gentleman, and it suited him well. And one night in a bar fight with some hunting friends, a gun went off and shot Oosley in the face and neck. And his wife, Harriet, lovingly nursed him back to health, but not, could not prevent him from losing the sight in his right eye. And he was another one of these one-eyed preachers, just like Christmas Evans. And apparently, uh, as a result of the scarring from the gunshot wounds and everything, he looked a pretty mean character uh, as a result of his scars and so on and so forth. But his wife saw that he needed more than just a physical recovery. And uh, she began to read to him. And she had a book, it was a book of poetry by a man called Edward Young, and it was called Night Thoughts. And a lot of these poems were uh, kind of very different to today's poetry, were about death and eternity. And this awakened him to his guilt and the certainty of, of eternity. And yet it didn't show him the remedy, remedy. It showed him his need, but it didn't point him to the remedy in any way. And so what he did, like many people, he tried to kind of pull himself up by his bootstraps and amend his ways, but unsuccessfully. But in 1791, something really unusual happened in Dunmore, County Galway. He had gone back there after losing the house that had been left to him. And now he's living in Dunmore. And the fourth Royal Irish Dragoon Guards were at that time occupying the local barracks. Remember, uh, basically, uh, Britain are occupying Ireland. They've got barracks everywhere. You still go there today. You can see the barracks in most cities uh, in order to uh, quell any rebellion or whatever. So 1791, uh, these I Royal Irish Dragoon Guards were there. 
that wasn't unusual because that was a normal thing to have different troops come to the barracks. What was unusual is that some of the soldiers hired a room at the local inn and not for drinking and carousing, but for hymn singing, prayer and preaching. That was very unusual. And word got out that they didn't have a prayer book. They just used the Bible for their praying and their preaching, and they had no prayer book. And that got his attention. In fact, out of curiosity, and maybe even suspicion, Gideon Oosley went to the inn, not for the usual purposes, but to, out of curiosity about these soldiers and their activities. And he heard a captain uh, of the dragoons preach a gospel message on Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like, uh, like, like crimson, they shall be as wool. And so, beautiful uh, verse, and uh, God invited him to receive mercy through the preaching of this man. Uh, and uh, he, he did have a clear view of eternity, uh, of being cast into everlasting misery, never ever to be released. But he, he began to think about the cost of following Christ. And it was holding him back because he knew it would mean a change of life. It would mean uh, being rejected by his his pals and all of the, the, the effects it would have on his family and his culture. And, and yet the fear of eternal separation from God was such that one day he finally fell on his knees and he said, Oh God, I will submit. <laughs> I will submit. Later he said this, I saw Jesus, Jesus, the savior of sinners, Jesus, the savior for me. I saw him as the gift of the love of God for me. Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. And I knew, yes, I knew that God had forgiven me all my sins. And my soul was filled with gladness. And I wept for joy. Oh, don't you love it when somebody gets well saved? Oh, it's a wonderful thing. And so at 29 years of age, Gideon Usley was a new man. And his testimony soon brought disturbance to the town of Dunmore because the local Church of Ireland curate opposed the Methodists and their insistence on original sin. And he called it rank nonsense. And when Gideon heard this preach from the pulpit, he couldn't contain himself and he waited for the man to finish. And then he stood up and he denounced the man as a false teacher, a false doctrine, and he said, the Bible teaches original sin and the creeds teach original sin. And you, sir, are in error. And uh, with great courage, he stood up against this man. And uh, he was filled with compassion for the people who were as ignorant as he had been. And he began to take every opportunity to speak to men about their souls. And he particularly loved wakes. Uh, when an Irish person died, they would hold a wake. And basically, they would stay by the body. Uh, part of it, maybe fear of spirits. I don't know what it was, but they would stay with the body. But it usually became an, a, an occasion for a lot of drinking and carrying on and carousing. But he would attend the wakes, and he would use them as an opportunity of asking the question, if that was you, where would you be in preaching the gospel? And although he had no formal training whatsoever, Gideon would say to himself, do you know the disease? And do you know what the cure is? And his conclusion had a divine authority about it. Go and tell them these two things, the disease and the cure, never mind the rest. And that became the passion of his life, to tell men the, the disease, that they're sinners, the impact of being a sinner, what that means eternally, and then telling them the cure, the, the marvelous work of Christ crucified, risen again for sinners. And so this is how he got started in his ministry. And of course, he had enough uh, funds from family reasons to just continue preaching without having to do any secular employment. And so without any recognition by man, he just went everywhere 
preaching the gospel wherever he could have opportunity to do so and became well known uh, to the Methodist uh, circuit uh, for his power in preaching the gospel. And uh, the year 1798, we'll talk now about the dynamic duo, and I'm not talking about Batman and Robin. This is a different dynamic duo. The year was 1798. It was a year of the Irish Rebellion. Having seen the, the American Revolution in 1776 succeed, the Irish, with the promise of help from the French, decided to finally overthrow the shackle of British rule. And of course, uh, the rebellion was crushed. The French didn't come forward with their promised support. And uh, most of the Irish just had pikes and maybe pitchforks against well-trained British soldiers. And it was put down quickly. But the Methodists endured very severe persecution at this time. Because although this, this Irish rebellion had the support of the Presbyterian Church and the Catholic Church, the Methodists stayed out of it. They said, that's not our business. Our business is not changing the state. It's changing hearts with the gospel of the grace of God. And so they got persecuted from both sides. So in 1799, a conference, the Irish Methodist Conference was held. And Thomas Coke, the man who replaced John Wesley, out of love and pity for the native Irish, introduced a general mission to the Irish. He was convinced that in addition to circuits and local preachers, there was a need for general missioners uh, who were co commissioned to preach across the land and to preach particularly in the native Irish language and reach the majority population. And the two men selected for this role were Gideon Oosley, and Charles Graham. Now, maybe another time we'll talk about Charles Graham. He was later had the name uh, attached to him as the Apostle of County Kerry and was greatly used in the gospel. But these two men uh, were, were able to labor together side by side for six years. And during those six years, it corresponded with that revival that I mentioned that spread across Ireland during those years. Gideon Oosley, when he heard the news of being selected for this role, he was happier than if he had been given a small fortune. So thrilled was he at the privilege of taking the gospel to the native Irish people. And so these men labored together. And again, they, although others were involved, uh, wherever there was real uh, advancement in the gospel, these two men could be found there uh, <clears throat> at the center of it all. What were their methods? Well, they preached on horseback, which was very novel in those days. They preached on horseback, and uh, part of it was an insurance policy for a quick getaway during riots. Uh, but they, they preached on horseback, and also <clears throat> Gideon Oosley had a very beautiful white horse. And so imagine these two men coming into town, one on a white horse, and they, they begin to speak in the native Irish dialect, and they just had a lot of attention. Uh, often they would deliberately choose their preaching place outside an Irish-owned shop, and they would back their horses up to the Irish shop window, knowing <clears throat> that the native Irish out of compassion for their own people, would not throw stones. If it was an English shop, they'd throw bricks at them, but they wouldn't do it if it was an Irish shop. So they would deliberately pick their spot, and then they would hold forth in the gospel. They wore black velvet caps and got the nickname of the black cap preachers. Often, they would show up at a Catholic church just as the people were coming out after Mass. Now, again, remember that the Irish church, the mass, and just like the Catholic church the world over until the 1960s, all the services until 62, 1962, all Catholic services were in Latin. And I can still remember, even though I was only two years old, but my dad loved the Latin mass, even though he couldn't understand a word of it, but I can still remember Kyrie eleison and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's amazing how it sticks in your mind. Uh, but anyway, uh, the people had no idea what the priest was saying. 
because they spoke Irish. None of them spoke Latin. So these men on their horseback would, would the crowds coming out of mass, they would sing a hymn in Irish. They would pray in Irish. And the people would just be astounded hearing somebody sing and pray in their language. And then they would take turns in preaching. And it had a tremendous impact. And frequently people said, actually, it was their praying that grabbed the attention of the people. They had never heard men converse with God like this. It just gripped them. And they, they just knew these men know God. And so they listened because of their praying. They listened to their preaching. Often as they would preach, the Spirit of God would come in deep conviction upon the people. And it, it became a bit like the day of Pentecost. Old and young would fall prostrate under the power of the preaching of the Word of God, often in the most public places, and refuse to be comforted until they knew Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Many of the Catholic people loved these men, and they called Usli in Gaelic, Sheed Navar, which means the silk of men. And so the idea is, you know, most men are just kind of rough cloth, but this man is the silk of men. And they knew that this man loved them. He loved their souls. The devil, of course, would not stand by idle and watch his hapless victims being one for Christ in such numbers as this. And so often the priest would stir up mobs and they suffered physically through stonings, dirt thrown at them, rotten eggs thrown at them. One day Gideon Usley lost two of his teeth to a well-aimed rock, blood pouring out of his mouth as he continued to preach the gospel. Occasionally he had to stop and empty his mouth of all the blood and then he'd keep going. And he said he thought it was a good thing as he had not shed blood for some time and was wondering if he had lost the anointing upon his ministry. Hard for us to even contemplate this kind of thing, but this was the way it was. A readiness to die was a precondition for open-air preaching in many parts of Ireland in those days. Don't do it unless you're ready to die. But these men were ready and willing. Often we, we read of them in the, the accounts of re riding 230 miles in five and a half days and preaching at every place they stopped, morning, noon, and night, heralding the gospel. When somebody asked uh, what his plan was, Gideon replied, I have no plan to give you, my son. The country is before you. Go into every open door, and if admitted, preach, and exhort, and pray proclaiming the grand truths of our holy Christianity. And while you thus preach with divine power and the love of God burning in your heart, you will never want for hearers. But he did have a, a style and he did have a plan. He had a, what was called, and the Methodists were very good at this, what they called an interrogatory style using questions to awaken interest and attention. They didn't assume that people were interested in their message. And so they would use questions to get people interested. So for an example, uh, speaking to a hostile Catholic crowd, Usley would say this, the Virgin had the best religion in the world. Plus, speaking of the Virgin Mary. The response would come from the crowd, what do you know about the Blessed Virgin? We don't want to hear a word. More than you think, said Mr. Oosley. I'm sure you'll be pleased with what I am about to tell you if you will only listen to me. He then proceeded to give the account of the wedding in Cana of Galilee, and from the word, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it, he would then point them... <laughs> to the words of Christ, you must be born again. So this was the kind of thing he did. Uh, in personal evangelism, very, very effective. Uh, one day there was a pilgrim visiting one of the holy mountains in Ireland, a place called Crow Patrick. And apparently the pilgrims would climb there barefoot 
uh, to try and earn merit before God. And so one day he is walking along with a pilgrim and he asks him, why are you here? And uh, the man replied, I want to find God. <laughs> and so Gideon says, what part of the mountain do you expect to find God on? The pilgrim confessed, uh, I never thought of that. And so he assured the man that God is everywhere. And he, he had as much opportunity to find God at home in his cabin as to travel 80 miles and start climbing a mountain because God is everywhere. The man returned home at least well instructed in the gospel and vowed he would never go on another pilgrimage. And this is the kind of methodology of Gideon Usley. But perhaps the one that thrills me the most is that often he would go to the Catholic mass. He'd just show up like Elijah. And as the priest was saying mass in Latin, anything that the priest said that was biblical, and that's the problem with Catholicism, there's got a little bit of Bible in there, but there's a lot of traditions that kind of, so anything biblical, he would translate into Irish and say, now think about that. And so basically he would preach through interpretation anything scriptural and then he would exhort the people afterwards and then leave just as quickly as he arrived and uh, Usley won many a catholic soul to the savior through simply explaining the gospel in those kind of ways he could not be satisfied in holding any meeting unless souls were brought to god at 75 years of age we find him preaching 36 times in 16 days, eight of those being in markets and in streets. So what can we learn about revival from this man and this movement? The theory of the Methodists is that no training for the work of God is like training in it. No training for the work of God is like training in it. In other words, the best way to learn about evangelism is to do evangelism. <laughs> the best way to learn about how to win souls is to just have at it. Go out there and share your faith with others. And that's how they operate it. The Irish Methodist Church woke up through their zeal. They woke up the sleeping denominations of Ireland in that day. This is written from these other denominations. Presbyterians, Anglicans, they said, the Methodists showed us how to labor, how to live, how to give, and how to suffer for Jesus and his cause. We learned from watching them. While Mr. Oosley prayed, this is again his colleague describing him as a man of prayer. He says, while Mr. Oosley prayed, the heavens opened. And there was a shaking among the dry bones. I shall scarcely forget his power with God in prayer. He wrestled with God in prayer for poor sinners and for the accompanying power of the Holy Spirit to make Christ known to them. So what are the results of Gideon Usley in his ministry? Despite immense moves of the Spirit, Multitudes being saved, vast numbers were lost to Ireland through the extensive immigration in the 19th century. The famine, 1847, 48, multitudes either died or emigrated. So, so <clears throat> it, it seemed like all that labor, as far as Ireland was concerned, left it still in a bleak state. But remember Wesley's words. Be patient with Ireland, she'll repay you. One person said, you cannot put your foot on any colony of the British Empire that does not include converts of Irish Methodism. Here's an example that you Canadians will appreciate. In 1881, there were 167 Methodist ministers in Ireland. In Canada, there were 170 ministers who were directly the fruit of Irish Methodism. 
because of emigration, end up more preaching in Canada than they were in Ireland. Australia, the US tell the same story. Wesley's conviction that Ireland will repay you was not disappointed. And so that is the challenging, I think, story of Gideon Usley, a man who had a passion for souls, a man who loved to preach where the gospel had not gone before, to people who had never heard it before, and to do it in a way that was so compelling that he had their undivided attention. And I'd say, Lord, raise up a new generation of effective evangelists who can reach our generation here and, of course, not forgetting Ireland and Europe as well. Amen.